Okay, this lesson video covers both chapters 3 and 4 of Outliers, The Trouble with Geniuses, Part 1 and 2. We'll be co covering both of these chapters over about three days of class time, and this video guide will kind of talk you through both chapters. Let's get started. These chapters are all about geniuses and how we think of geniuses. If you've been noticing a pattern in Gladwell's argument, you might be able to predict that Gladwell is going to attempt to shed some light on some problems with how we think about genius. He's going to talk about this man, Lewis Terman, a Stanford psychology professor who, over the course of several, several, several years, studied the lives of, of individuals who started out very young as children being labeled as geniuses. And he followed them and studied them and looked to see what became of them. These were children who had scored very high on IQ tests and he wanted to see how that translated into success in life. So over the course of their lives and his life, he studied these child prodigies, these amazingly bright, smart kids, to see what effect this had over the course of their life and if they remained successful and they became successful, to kind of see how IQ fits into that. And he discovered some interesting things. Gladwell is also going to introduce us to IQ tests and how they're designed and how they're made and what they measure. He's going to tell us about how IQ tests measure a certain type of thinking. That's not the only type of thinking, but it measure, measures convergent thinking. And as you may guess, he's going to have a problem with this test and suggest that maybe there's better measures of intelligence, like a divergent thinking test. How more important than passing an IQ test would be thinking of as many different ways that you could use a brick and a blanket to accomplish something. Gladwell suggests that this is a far more important type of knowledge for us to measure to gauge how successful someone's going to be. He's going to also show us how not all Nobel Prize winners go to Harvard. And that just because Harvard gets the best and brightest does not mean that they have the most Nobel Prize winners, which are people at the height of success in academic thought and in peace and in literature. These are the best of the best of the best. And not as many as you think come from the most elite universities we have. After he debunks some of what we thought we knew about what it means to be intelligent and what it means to be a genius and, and the type of thinking that's required to be a smart person, and he'll show us that just because you have a high IQ does not guarantee your success. He looks at the case of two people who we would consider brilliant, off-the-charts geniuses. Um, one's name is Robert Oppenheimer. He's the physicist partly responsible for the creation of the atomic bomb. Gladwell will interestingly explore this man's story and how someone with his intelligence, opportunity, and social skills could turn those things into success, while other people, like a genius, off-the-charts, brilliant man named Chris Langan, are not able to convert that into something that we would consider conventional success. Gladwell compares these two men and compares their stories uh, to show us some interesting conclusions about what it means to be successful and what it means to be smart. So we're going to watch a YouTube clip of a new story on Chris Langan, the other brilliant gentleman. Well, you don't often run into a farmer or anyone, for that matter, that uh, uses his spare time to dabble in quantum physics or hardcore scientific theory. But as our Kansas City ABC affiliates Maria Antonio reports, one Missouri farmer has interests and talents that go way beyond what most people seem capable of. Christopher lives on a northern Missouri farm surrounded by fields. How are you doing today? Surrounded by animals and surrounded by signs of intelligence. For decades, he has worked on a theory, but if you see what he writes, how much of his cognitive theoretic model of the universe would you understand? My theory 
is a mapping or correspondence between the language of thought and the real world. Act 2, The Smart Guy. In 1999, ABC aired a story on Chris. They sent him to a neuropsychologist. Hello, Chris. For a standard IQ test, two hours of problem solving. His score reported as too high to measure. The highest individual that I have ever measured in 25 years of doing this. Experts tell us most people have IQs around 100, college grads average 120, above 130 qualifies for membership in Mensa. Chris's estimated IQ has been reported at 195. According to statistics, only one in 100 million people have a score at that level. I like to maintain a little bit of modesty because it's healthy to do that. It's not healthy to get a big head. But from the time he was a little kid, Chris says he knew. Yes, give me a few grades early. So I started uh, suspecting that I was different then. Despite smiles and photos, Chris explains growing up smart and poor got him beat up in school and at home. In my family, it was not politically correct to be a genius. Uh, my stepfather didn't like... Uh, uh, you know, they used to tell me all the time nobody likes a smart ass. So he got into bodybuilding to fight back. His name and his work appear in books, but a young Chris never finished college. He cites a lack of money, transportation, patience. So at that point I dropped out and at that uh, I became a blue collar guy. In places like West Hampton Beach, New York, he worked as a bar bouncer. If you're so smart, why aren't you filthy rich? He is asked that, but Chris has always charted a different course. Having lots of nice stuff is not something that anybody has any business associating with genius. He has lots of books and one purpose, which brings us back to Chris's theory. I can remember asking my grandfather, is there a God? Now in his 50s, that's what he's been working to prove all along. And so if you have a theory that you say implies the existence of God, uh, for example, well, you're falling afoul of the scientific method. You know, how can we test for the existence of God? Meanwhile, he has a wife, Gina, and a farm to run outside the world of theories. I'm at peace with myself. <laughs> Hi, Snoopy. I actually enjoy my life. We've got a lovely place here, and uh, I'm quite happy here. Yeah, he's a good boy. He's a good boy. So... Be sure to pay close attention to our reading schedule for the next few days. Um, the first two days that we're working on these chapters, we'll read all of chapter, chapter 3 in class those two days. And for the first time, instead of a reading guide, you're switching over to a strategy log, where you read and you log rhetorical strategies for each section that we read. Um, for homework for those two days, you're going to need to watch the video guide for chapter four, which is actually this video guide, so you don't need to watch that, and read sections one and two of chapter four while completing the strategy log. Then, in class, we'll read sections three and four of chapter four and complete the strategy log, and you'll read five and six of chapter four on your own and complete the strategy log. Before you read, make sure you review rhetorical strategies that you need to brush up on. Starting with this chapter, you no longer have that reading guide and you're going to need to spot those strategies. So you got to know them well enough to be able to see them on your own. While you read, fill in your strategy log. Think about the rhetorical triangle in writer's craft. Still use the dictionary or dictionary.com to find the meaning of words you don't know. And think about what argument Gladwell is making and what kind of evidence he uses to support it. Finally, after you read, as a class, we're going to see how we do with both convergent and divergent thinking tests. And we'll discuss the concept of elevated language and multiple literacies, which we've already talked about a little in the past, but we're going to explore more why that's important.